One of the greatest wide receivers in NFL history will be in the booth for CBS this Sunday. James Lofton and James, we've got to start with Jake Browning, who is spectacular on Monday night in Jacksonville. What stood out to you about that performance? Well, the great thing about him performing so well, he's, he's a California native. We, we know that and I, from California. He also played in the Pac-12. I played in the Pac-8. Next year, the <laughs> Pac-2. <laughs> uh, I, I think that he never got flustered during the course of the ball game. Uh, early on, Bengals threw a lot of short passes, and you're going, okay, let's throw the ball down the field. And then when he started to throw the ball down the field, he was ultra successful. So it, it was a, a perfect game for a guy who's stepping in, and, and it'll just see what the follow-up act will be like. It's kind of like one of those movies with a bunch of sequels. We know the prequel, a guy who gets – you know, bounced around, doesn't get signed anywhere, has a good, great high school career, good college career, and then can't get any traction in the pros, but looks like he has his footing uh, pretty well cemented right now. James, you're on a Super Bowl team in Buffalo where Jim Kelly got hurt in the final regular season game, and his backup, Frank Reich, was able to lead you to a couple of playoff wins before Jim got healthy, and then you guys went to the Super Bowl. What does a team have to do to rally around the backup quarterback? I think what the team really needs to do is not to worry. Uh, it's really in the coach's hands at that point to devise a game plan that caters a little more to the skills of the guy who's coming in than the guy he's trying to replace. The Bengals are 6-6. Six and six with five games to go. Four of those five games are against teams that are missing their starting quarterback, at least right now. What do you think of the Bengals' chances with a month left in the season? Well, I, I never hear this phrase uttered during training camp, but we control our own destiny. And just think about it, at the training camp, you control your own destiny. If you were to go 17-0, and 0, I, I think that's a pretty good record. And even now, at six and six, if you can win the last five games, and, and yes, you're not going to play on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but if you can win each game that you play, you got a really, really good chance of being in the playoffs because 10, 11 wins almost secures you a playoff spot. We are visiting with Hall of Fame wide receiver James Lofton. Last week, Jamar Chase became the fourth wide receiver in history to have 80-plus catches and 1,000-plus yards in each of his first three seasons. What makes you go wow when you watch Jamar Chase? Well, it's not so much the numbers that guys are putting up now because there's more passing to the game. But the thing about Jamar Chase, and, and normally I use this phrase about running backs, it's contact balance. When you watch him play, you know, he, you know we talk about Jalen Hurts and all that he can squat. If he can squat 700 pounds, I'm pretty sure Jamar Chase can squat 695 pounds because his lower body just looks so firm. He, he doesn't get bumped off his routes. He goes where he wants to on the football field. And that's a trait that a lot of receivers don't have. They get pushed out where the defensive back wants to push them to. That doesn't happen to Jamar Chase at all. T. Higgins was back on Monday night after missing three games with a hamstring injury. What does T mean to this offense? Well, he, he's, a, he's a big body. He's a, when you take the three receivers as a group, you really can't double team or shade coverage to anybody and even though we're talking about t higgins the guy that i got to take my hat off to is tyler boyd sure. and he came into the league he was robin to aj green's batman then he turned into batman then somebody else shows up he turns back into robin now he's alfred the trusted guy who <laughs> gets everybody where they're supposed to be and, and i just love his spirit and the way that he plays the game and the unselfishness, which all three receivers, I think really, that's the attitude that they have that I see from them because they could all be stars in their own right. But collectively together, they're awesome. James, I'm glad you mentioned A.J. Green because the Bengals have had some great wide receivers in their history. Isaac Curtis, Chad Johnson, A.J. Green, Jamar Chase, and others. Do you have a guy at the top of your totem pole from the Bengals all-time list? Well, you, you named him first. When I was a, going into my senior year at Stanford, Bill Walsh came in and he came down to the track where I was and he said, he said, who, who did you uh, piss off? And I said, so what do you mean? He said, why haven't you been playing <clears throat> on the football team? I said, well, you know, they told me I could run track. So when the football season was over, I might be second string and then I'd come back in the fall and I was third string. 
And he said, well, that's not going to happen. He said, I got some tape I want you to watch. And I had never watched tape of a professional receiver. And he showed me film on Isaac Curtis. And he said, this is the guy that you could be like. And I never had anybody tell me that I could be a professional, that I could be like somebody who was in the pros. And uh, so Isaac Curtis has always stood out to me. And, and I was fortunate to relay that story to him about three or four years ago. And, uh, you know, Bill Walsh was special to a lot of people and really special to me. And that uh, association with Isaac Curtis, even though Isaac didn't know it for years, always stood out to me. When I picture your playing days and picture Isaac's playing days, you two guys remind me of each other in a lot of ways. You had the tremendous speed, obviously. You had several seasons where you averaged more than 20 yards a catch, but it was more than that. It was the style with which you played. Did you try to emulate Isaac in that way, or is that just a similar personality with you two guys? It might just be similar personalities. I know, This I know about Isaac Curtis. When he was in high school, he was a great running back. I, I was a bad high school quarterback, and I didn't have the running skills that he had. When I saw some of his highlights, and I go back and I Google them now, I go, man, he, he was really awesome. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get a lot of credit for when you're playing, and then, then he merges with Chris Collinsworth. He beats out David Verser again. You haven't heard that name in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so Isaac Curtis was, was special in his era and, and probably a guy along with Ken Anderson who, who didn't get the credit that he deserved a lot of times. James, you played in three straight Super Bowls with the Buffalo Bills and played for one of the great leaders of all time in Marv Levy. What do you think of Zach Taylor and does he have any Marv Levy qualities when you watch the way he coaches this team? I, I remember meeting Zach Taylor in his first year when this team was not where it is now. We'll just put it like that mildly. And, and I said, man, he's got, he's got a tough road in front of him. It's interesting when I watch the young coaches come in now, they have a passion for the game. They have the energy to pursue it 24 hours a day, and they do that. And if given the right elements to the systems that they want to play, to the things that they see uh, dancing in their head at night, they, they can get it done. And he's been able to do that. And, you know, you look no further than the stability that they've had along the offensive line mix in the skill players, get the quarterback, get a fine guy to uh, tutor the, everybody on defense. So there's a lot that goes into it, not just the calm demeanor. But Zach, it, it's, it's interesting. He had a big grin on his face in one of the passes that Browning completed. And so you could just see the joy that he had and the happiness that he has for his players. And I think that that infectious quality just goes throughout the whole organization. James, you've got the Bengals and Colts this Sunday. Indianapolis is 7-5. and five. The Colts have a four-game winning streak. They only won four games all of last year. What's impressed you about Indy? Well, I, I was there in Jacksonville when we had Minshew Mania. And Gardner Minshew is, is a, a guy who, you know, against all odds, yes, he was drafted, but, but he's not supposed to be a starting quarterback. And he started 32 games in the NFL already. So what used to be two full seasons, uh, he's already had that under his belt, and and he just kind of creates sometimes. You might not see a lot there. He creates. He doesn't make a ton of errors, and he but he does take risk. So that's impressive. Uh, Quentin Nelson, the left guard, is, is so much fun to watch. It, it's like having a refrigerator out there and just pushing the refrigerator forward because he may not be agile, but you shouldn't be in front of him. <laughs> It's an important game for both of these teams. As I mentioned, the Colts are seven and five. The Bengals are six and six. What are a few things Cincinnati must do on Sunday to come away with a win? Well, they have to have the right attitude. And by that, I mean, take the things that we do well, the Cincinnati Bengals, and continue to do them. Find a hole here or there that you can exploit against the Indianapolis Colts. And, and that's what the coaching staff is geared for. Because you, you just don't go in and say, okay, let's see what's going to happen. When we looked last week and you saw Chase Brown run the ball really well, there were a couple of plays that they ran, and they ran them over and over again about five or six times because what they saw is they saw a defense that wasn't adapting to the way that they were blocking. So sometimes you, you get lucky on something like that. But I think in this ball game, you, you got to go with, with the stars that you have. We talked about the receivers already. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Joe Mixon, who I think is, is a top five running back. He may not have all the yards that everybody has, but when you watch him play, every ounce of energy, 
I don't believe in 110%. I don't believe in second effort. I believe in 100% and effort throughout the play. And you see that every time Joe Mixon touches the ball. I mean, it's, I would not want to be in his way trying to tackle him. Final question for the great James Lofton. You never played in Cincinnati in your NFL career, but you did play for Forrest Gregg in Green Bay. What was your experience like playing for Forrest? Forrest had a ton of respect for the game. And I remember there was one Saturday we were getting ready to play the Rams. And um, so we're, you know, it's a loose practice on Saturday, a little bit of a walkthrough, and there's some jokes and stuff like that. And so we said, "Uh oh, here comes Deacon Jones. And Forrest went into attack mode. And he goes, Deacon Jones never got around me. And (laughs) what you realized at that moment is how much pride he had for that area that was right in front of him and a yard or two to the side of him in each direction. That's what he owned on the football field, and he took so much pride in it, and that was special about Forrest Gregg. James, this is great. I always appreciate your time. Travel safe to Cincinnati and look forward to seeing you on Sunday. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great game, great atmosphere.